Dear Kalila, I can't tell you how fantastically wonderful it was to receive your letter. These last years have been hell without you, and I can't apologize enough, but without outside support, I can't do anything about it. I remember when Mum first started talking about how she was going to Cambodia. She said she was going to meet someone who she thought was very trustworthy, and she was probably going to get a good career out of it, so we were all pretty excited about it. Never regret your mistakes, only regret that you didn't try. Love you forever and hope to hear from you again soon. Your mummy always, XOXO. But I never thought that she'd just disappear from our lives entirely. <laughs> it was pretty crazy. I hadn't heard of Yosho Taylor. It seemed like she'd slipped through the system. Her case did not have much press attention, particularly in Australia, and she really had been forgotten by everyone and left in that Cambodian prison. I knew I wasn't important, so I didn't think anyone really cared about me being there except for the people who loved me. I didn't really know if anyone knew that I was there. It's one of those cases, once you heard about Yoshe's plight, you couldn't let it go. Do you want to send a message to your kids? I miss you. I don't remember when I started talking to the Precious Max because I was talking to him for a long time. We talked about work and our work history. We talked about an orphanage that he visited and donated time and things to. I thought I got to know him and he seemed very nice. Precious Max was in his 20s. He had an amazing body. He was good looking. He was charismatic. He was a successful businessman. So really, he was everything that a woman could want. But Precious Max was too good to be true. He was a gentleman who was very busy running several intimate relationships online at the same time. This guy destroyed my entire life, my existence. I don't want to show myself because drugs are dangerous, you know. He's in a drug cartel, you know. People die. Precious Max was part of an international drug syndicate who were operating to lure Australian men and women to travel to Cambodia to bring drugs back into Australia. It's more than likely that the syndicate is continuing to operate. And it concerns me because, uh, um, you know, who, who knows? Who knows? You know, who's next? I hate being stuck inside, but I can't be around lots of people. So I wanted to live in the country. In the year 2000, we moved to Esk in the Brisbane Valley. Ten and a half acres, so it was beautiful out there. Mum was a teacher. She taught a lot of primary school students and she liked how she could get along with, like, the kids and the parents as well, like really well. At the school I went to, she was known as everyone's favorite teacher. So that was pretty cool. Yoshi had a huge passion for children and teaching, but just children in general. It was her driving force. Very colorful person herself, often dressed very colorful. Because Yoshe was such an individual and her teaching style was so creative, it was hard for her because 
um, the curriculum didn't seem to give a lot of flexibility for her to be able to use that creativity in her classroom. I think it came to a point where she was a square peg in a round hole. My philosophies were not always understood by colleagues and um, that led to, led to difficulties in the workplace. It was around mid-2010 that I left the home unit. Yoshe at that time, she took full care of the children and eventually she ended up having to leave the school. I think things got really hard for her and she quite possibly was feeling quite alone. <coughs> Kay lives out in the suburbs in Melbourne with her cats. She was in her 40s. She had never really had a long-term partner and she was certainly looking for love. Around November, December 2011, I sort of found myself in a vulnerable position after a sort of fling with another man who turned out to be a serial dater. And then Kay uh, started a conversation with a man named Precious Max on an internet dating site called Tagged. And they fell in love shortly thereafter. Mm. He said that he was from South Africa. He was 34 years old and he worked in an import-export business. I didn't question him. I didn't look him up on Google. I didn't, you know, I believed him. So we just talked about life and sort of got serious after a while. During the months that they were communicating online, there were several instances where Precious Max would ask Kay to send over a laptop or send over some sort of package um, to him uh, in Cambodia. Now, I believe that he was doing this to groom Kay and to test whether or not she would be someone who would be easily convinced to assist him further. It was only small stuff in the beginning, like shirts and phones and laptops. He'd send me money to send it on to him in Cambodia. I didn't ask, I didn't question it. In 2013, Yoshe wasn't in a good place in, in terms of her life. She was struggling to pay off a mortgage. You know, she had her kids she was trying to take care of and um, sort of struggling to look for new work, wanting to get some new opportunity. It, it got to the point where I, I couldn't emotionally cope anymore. Um, and I, I, ha I had a bit of broke, breakdown and I went and saw a counsellor. But she did try very hard and her priorities were always the children's um, come first and to put the food on the table and to make sure their needs were all met. It was 2013. My best friend said to me that I needed to start meeting people. I'd been all by myself for a, a long time, four years, just me and the kids. But I, I didn't feel like I was ready for dating. I just wanted to meet people. Precious Max starts talking to Yoshe Taylor through the tagged website. And that conversation quickly moves to emails, messenger, uh, and starts to talk to her in a very similar way as he has been speaking to Kay Smith. Now he starts his little game plan, which he's used on others, obviously, uh, like Kay Smith, you know, tries to get the women he's in contact with to sell stolen items. And Yoshe wasn't buying that. 
And she says, why would I do that? Like, it, the amount of time it's going to take me to, like, try and sell this thing and it's not worth, like, you know, don't waste my time, you know. It's clear from the communication that both Kay Smith and Yosho have with Precious Max that neither of them are aware of each other's existence. Kay thought she was in an exclusive relationship that was going to go the distance. But there would be times when Precious Max would disappear and he wouldn't contact Kay for a number of days. He would come back with the most obvious and pathetic excuses. It would be things like, oh, sorry, babe, someone got sick down at the uh, orphanage and I had to, had to be down there helping out for a few days. And um, Kay bought this. I think the reason I kept talking to Precious online was because I had feelings for him. I didn't want to break that up. I think I was too far gone emotionally, mentally, to sort of back out. I just wanted to see where it'd go. By the middle of 2013, the relationship between Precious Max and Yosha is intensifying and he is asking her to travel to Cambodia so that they can actually meet in person. I'd never been anywhere. I wanted to go somewhere. He said that he would pay for the ticket, but I wanted to know that he was a real person. So first of all, I asked him to send me a copy of his passport. And I said that I didn't want his, like the ticket needed to be paid in cash, not with a credit card, because I knew that there were credit card scams. And so he agreed to both those things. She made sure that the children were going to be looked after while she was away and, and she seemed excited. On the 27th of June 2013, she flies out of Brisbane and meets Precious Max in Cambodia, in Phnom Penh. He came with another man to pick me up and it looked just like the picture. They took me to a really nice hotel. It was just like, I'm in Asia, you know. I was really happy. Like, I was just really happy to look at the things there and see five people on one motorbike and, and <laughs> tuk-tuks, and I had a really good time. I didn't rule out the possibility of a romance, but at the same time, I was, it's a, the, the distance and all of that, there was a lot of doubt for me. It was more about making a friend that I knew was real and <laughs> I thought I had. Yoshe returns to Brisbane on the 4th of July 2013. Shortly thereafter, about a week or so, Precious Max is then sending messages to Kay Smith asking that she also travel to Cambodia to meet him in person. Precious organised everything from his end. He sent me money to order my passport and I filled out all the applications. He actually wanted me to get an emergency passport. I questioned him on it because it wasn't an emergency that I need to be over there. The first itinerary came through somebody else's name. I asked him if he'd sent me somebody else's itinerary. When he sent me my itinerary, it said four days. I asked him why it was so short and he said that he had urgent business to attend to and that I could come back weeks later. Precious and I I thought we'd made friends. I told him that I wasn't interested in a relationship, that um, I thought he was a wonderful person, but it, he's too young for me, it's not right. Like, he'll find someone good for him. 
He knew I was looking for work, looking at doing something different. It's clear from the conversations between Yoshe and Precious that he's aware of her financial concerns and the pressure that's upon her raising her two children. And so when Yoshe tells Max, I don't think this relationship's going to work, he quickly jumps on the idea that she could then work in Brisbane for a friend of his in Cambodia, importing Cambodian arts and crafts. And in the middle of July 2013, a contract is sent to Yoshe for consideration. The person I was supposed to be working for was a man named Mr Chan at KNN Arts and Crafts. The contract said I would start an art, open an arts and crafts store in Queensland, that I would be um, the manager and I would have an income, like a specific income. They wanted to pay six months in advance rent on the property, which made me feel very safe. Like, that means that there was a commitment there. He's offering her, you know, the ability to escape the circumstances that she's in. And, you know, he's really got, a, you know, the hooks. She's jumped right on the hook. Precious asked me to come over again and I got uh, an email saying to cover expenses, they'd give me $1,000 to come over to Cambodia and discuss the job. My experience with living with Yoshe for so many years was that she was very naive. I warned her just to, you know, be careful of what she's doing and what she's accepting. Mum was like, if this trip is successful and everything's good, you can come with me the next time we go. I was excited because I haven't been, I haven't gone outside of Australia before, so I was like, oh, nice, a holiday. So Yoshe returns to Cambodia on the second trip. She's taken to a number of business meetings. It's shown to her that this is a legitimate um, offer of employment. She's taken to the local hospital for a number of medical tests to ensure that she's fit for work. I hadn't met Mr Chan because they told me that his English was not strong and that it would embarrass him to not understand me or if I didn't understand him. So that made sense to me. When Yosho is about to leave Cambodia for the second time, Precious Max asks her at the last minute, can she take a bag back to Queensland, somewhere near Brisbane, to hand over to a art dealer contact of his. I didn't even think about it really. I thought I was working for this arts and crafts store and this was my new boss and I, I was happy to do something helpful for the new boss. On the 19th of August, Yoshe travels back to Brisbane from Cambodia and everything is fine. She brings the artifacts back and on the following day, she arranges to meet the person, the friend of Precious Max, and she hands over those artefacts to him. Just five days after Yoshe returns from her second trip to Cambodia, Kay is on a plane, winging her way to see Precious Max for the first time. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Pompeii. I didn't know anything about flying overseas at all. I didn't know anything about Cambodia. Um, I was petrified. I had no idea where to meet him when I got off the plane. But when I first came face to face with Precious, I thought he was as good looking in person as he was online. We went to the big Cambodian market. I think it's in the middle of Phnom Penh somewhere. He bought me 15 pairs of shoes. I don't think I've worn one pair. The first night we were there, he actually took me to a restaurant with his friend and he proposed marriage to me. Stupidly, I said yes. Just thought this was a dream come true. My last night in Cambodia with Precious, he asked me to take a two laptop bags back 
with me. Um, they had ornaments and T-shirts and placemats from Cambodia. She regularly watched those border security shows, so she was suspicious and she did um, perform her own examination on the bag. Nothing was untoward, so I put it back in and I had a look in the other one. It was, in, you know, they were pretty much the same contents. So I, fine, it was fine with me to take back. In late August 2013, Kay arrives back in Melbourne, recently engaged, her nails freshly painted, courtesy of Precious Max. I turned my phone on, and so when we got to customs, it was just ridiculously going off. Like every time, every time it stopped ringing, it started ringing again. And who was calling you? Precious, the whole time. Unbeknownst to her, she proceeds through security, carrying uh, just over two kilos of heroin in her bag. And they asked me why. And it was just a short stay, and I said it was a surprise engagement. It was my own. And um, they went through all my bags. And they came back probably 10 minutes later to say that they'd done. She was utterly gobsmacked at what was in her bag, uh, frightened, shocked, uh, not knowing who to trust. On the same day that Kay Smith arrives back in Australia, an Australian man also arrives into an Australian airport carrying laptop bags concealed with heroin which is identical to the bags that Kay Smith has carried into Australia as well. He is arrested. The young man had flown in to Australia and was found with a similar amount of drugs. He was lured in by a young, attractive 19-year-old woman named Charlene Savarino. The plot was thickening and the web was getting wider. Within days of Kay Smith and the other man arriving back and being arrested by Australian Federal Police, Yoshe tells Precious Max that the budget they have in mind for the Cambodian Arts and Crafts store is not going to be enough and that they're going to have to increase their budget. Precious uses this opportunity to insist that Yoshe has to travel back to Cambodia to ask for further funds from the boss. Originally, the plan had been to open the shop and that I would make another trip over to Cambodia with my children. She seemed very genuine of the opinion that it was a business deal and that her children were going to get a, a great experience out of being able to see another nation. And I had almost been convinced by that point that maybe she was on to a good deal and so I had even signed the paperwork for her to get the visas for the children. But this was an unexpected trip. It wasn't the trip we had been planning to do as a family. There was not even a thought of taking the kids. On September 14, I arrived back in Cambodia and I expected to be met by Precious, but I was met by a girl named Charlene, a French girl, uh, instead. She said that she was an employee of Mr Chan's and I was really excited about that, that I was meeting a fellow employee. She said she had heard about Precious through Mr Chan, but he wasn't there that last trip. On the last day of Yoshe's third trip, Charlene meets Yoshe in the foyer of her hotel and provides her with a backpack containing Cambodian fabrics. Charlene gives Yoshe very strict instructions that these fabrics are worth a great deal of money and that she must ensure that she carries these items in the bag on the plane with her home. 
then I went up to my hotel room and I pulled out all the pieces and I laid them out on the bed and I took photos. Um, I searched the bag as well because the, the passport had said, you know, to pack your own bag and I couldn't see anything wrong with the bag at all. Charlene came back to pick me up and she took me to the airport and she said that she would wave to me as I went upstairs. When I got to the top of the stairs, a small Cambodian man came running up behind me and he called my name and he asked me to go into a room and I, I wasn't really surprised. Like I thought maybe because I had a work visa, they, they look at um, you differently. He went straight for the backpack and he pulled out the materials and then he got a Stanley knife and cut down the spine of the bag. And that was when I saw the powder. And I was, I was a bit in shock then. He asked me who had given me the bag and I said, Charlene did. And he got straight onto a walkie talkie and said, grab her, like pick her up now. She was still downstairs and he brought her up to the room and then he tested the, the powder in front of her and it was heroin. They asked her who gave her the bag and she said Precious Max gave her the bag. After Charlene is detained by police, they go to Precious Max's house and he is arrested there. Found in the house was a large quantity of drugs and money. They took us all into a room together to test the drugs for purity and they needed our thumbprints. I didn't have any idea that Charlene and Precious knew each other and they said something about having caught her outside the airport and he turned around to her and when I told you never to stay with them at the airport. Police spent a whole day telling me that, that Mr Chan didn't exist and that there were two Australians, one man, one woman, who had been tricked in Australia the month before this happened to me, and that um, the Cambodians had been notified and they were following Precious and Charlene um, because both of their names had been given. Cambodian media at the time were directly quoting Cambodian police as stating that they were working in close coordination with Australian authorities in the arrest of these three individuals. I remember thinking I was really glad they, they caught them, like that they stopped me from taking it back. And that my kids hadn't got caught up in all of that. I was charged with international drug smuggling and I had no idea what would happen. <laughs>